In this series of lectures, we are going to review the concept of inverse trig functions. First, let's discuss the idea of inverse. Uh, notice we have a graph, and on the x-axis, everything is in terms of time. The y-axis is in terms of population. And so what we're looking at is the way that the population is changing as the time changes. But sometimes it's convenient to reverse the way we're thinking about the variables. So by reversing them, we're going to look at, as the population changes, what's happening to the time. And if we were to reverse this graph, using the exact same information, the shape of our graph will instead look something like this. Now a couple things to notice. I'm going to sketch in the original function, right? It's a rough sketch. The original function will look something like this. And these functions graphically have been reflected across the line y equals x. Right? It's just a reflection over that line. That's what's happened graphically. What's happened algebraically is that instead of having an input of time and an output of population, those two things have switched. And the way that inverse functions in general are related is that the domain of one function corresponds to the range of its inverse. Right? So in terms of a table, we might have a function who has a table that looks something like this. If the x values are 1, 2, and 3, then the outputs, the function's values, might be 4, 5, and 6. Now if we were looking at the inverse of that function, then the inputs and the outputs, and I'm using the notation f negative 1 of x, which is the shorthand for the inverse of f, the table would look like this. The inputs would be 4, 5, and 6, and the outputs would be 1, 2, and 3. Right? The values of the domain and the range are switched. They correspond with one another. Now if we had a function like y equals 2x plus 6, this is a function. Right? We'll say that this is f of x. And if we just interchange the variables, we would have x equals 2y plus 6. And this gives us, um, by interchanging them, the inverse relation. If we were to solve this for y, we would have 1 half x minus 3 equals y, and this is the inverse function of f. One thing that's interesting about all inverse functions is that if you were to substitute the inverse into the original function or substitute the original function into the inverse, you will always end up with just your original input and variable. Let's show this with our previous example. So if we were to take our original function, 2x plus 6, and substitute the inverse function into it, 4x, we'll have 2 times the inverse function, 1 half x minus 3, plus 6. This becomes x minus 6 plus 6, which simplifies down to just x, right? That's a property of all inverse functions. And the graphs will always be mirror images of one another with respect to the 45 degree line or the line y equals x. So that's the idea of inverse functions. Now inverse trig functions is just applying the idea of inverse functions to trigonometry. So let's consider the sine function y equals sine of x. If we were to exchange the variables and solve for y, what we would need to do is undo the sine process on both sides. And so showing our work 
maybe longhand. I'm going to undo this. I'm going to do the inverse operation of sine on the left and on the right. It's a way to understand this algebraically. And if you undo taking the sign, just like if you undo multiplying or undo addition, you're left with the thing that you started with. This would be the inverse sine function. Now, inverse sine is also known as arc sine. So the notation is the same. These two things mean the same thing. It's important also that you recall that this, the inverse sine, does not mean the reciprocal of sine. It just simply doesn't mean that. It's not, the negative one is not being used as an exponent in that case. And if we meant the exponent of negative one, it would be shown that way. Let's consider the sine graph, and then we'll contrast it with the arc sine graph. So a sine graph has this kind of shape, and it just keeps repeating. I'll do the arc sine graph in red. The arc sine graph looks something like this. and it's been reflected over y equals x. Now some things that end up being important. You should notice that immediately the arc sine or the inverse sine is not a function. It's not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So because arc sine, and this is true of arc cosine as well, are not functions, it is customary to restrict the range or the outputs that we would get. When we're talking about the arc sine of x, we always restrict the range to negative pi halves to pi halves. And again, this is the range or the y values. And the reason we do that I'll sketch an arc sine graph again, just the, just one, one cycle of it. So again, we're talking about the outputs that we would get. We're only going to run from negative pi halves to pi halves. And the reason we restrict arc sine in between these two measures is because if you go past pi halves and continue up, your repeating values, and if you go past negative pi halves and continue down, your repeating values again. And so there are some range restrictions. We're only dealing with the branches that are nearest the origin. Right, so this would be a full graph of the arc sign. Now it's a function. Now you can graph arc sine and arc tangent on your calculators as well, and I'll sketch them in. If you graph these on your calculator, your calculator, most of them, will graph more, will graph the piece as if it wasn't a function. And you just need to know this as a fact. So here this is going to be one for the arc cosine graph, that it's always restricted. So here's what you'll see on your calculator. And for arc cosine, or inverse cosine, the range is restricted to being between 0 and pi. So since the range is between 0 and pi, that means that we're only going to use fully, I'm going to erase some stuff here, this portion of the graph. y is 0, y is pi. That's the function portion of arc cosine. And arc tangent does a similar thing. 
right, the graph of arc tangent or inverse tangent. Remember that a tangent graph just the cycles repeat and there's vertical asymptotes, so you shouldn't be surprised that there would be horizontal asymptotes on arc tangent, and they happen every pi units. And since tangent isn't defined at pi halves and negative pi halves, then arc tangent is not defined at those y values. And the graph of arc tangent, to keep it as a function, looks something like this, where the range is restricted to be between, actually it's not equal, to be between negative pi halves and positive pi halves, but again, it'll never equal those two things because tangent doesn't have those values. Uh, finally, one thing that was helpful to me is to consider the question. Let's talk about it in terms of the sine of x. If we're looking at sine of x, the question is the angle, that's bad e, the angle x has what sine value? Right, that's the question that goes with the statement, the sine of x. Arc sine, or inverse sine, is asking a different question. The question is, what angle has a sine value of x? And I know for me, it's really helpful to remind myself of the question associated with it, just so I can have my thinking going in the right direction. So in part two, we'll continue our review of inverse trig, and then we will deal with some example problems.